Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, thank you for uh, a very nice and long introduction. Um, but first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is a great honor to be here uh, in Aspetar, and also congratulations with a fantastic conference, ACL Rehab Conference this weekend. I think we all enjoyed it very much, so great work. Um, <coughs> today, I have no um, conflict of interest and the learning objectives are like this. Uh, the content of this um, talk is about ACL injury prevention programs, very shortly. The barriers for implementation, uh, I would try to give some possible solutions for them so and, and talk a little bit about uh, research gaps. <coughs> I'm sorry, my voice, I'm not used to air condition. <laughs> we don't need that in Norway. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Um, uh, an ACL injury is not only devastating for the athlete with a long rehabilitation, re-injuries and an uh, increased risk of early osteoarthritis. It is also costly for the society. And the burden of sustaining an ACL injury is extensive and multifaced. Reducing the number of these injuries would benefit both athletes and individuals as so and society as a whole. And now first I will just try to go through uh, some of the studies, ACL prevention studies and lower extremity prevention studies that have been published since around 2000. And there is quite a lot of prevention studies, some um, court studies and a lot of uh, uh, randomized control studies, uh, a lot of studies uh, in the beginning in handball. Uh, and then the 11 came and the 11 didn't function well. so. We developed the, the 11 plus, the FIFA 11 plus. Uh, we had a lot of studies from Canada, prevention studies, which was really good. Uh, then the, the, the knee control study came from Sweden, which is maybe that study with the, call them the most successful result because they had a, in this randomized study, they were only looking at ACL injuries among uh, youth female football players. And in, the, in the, those who did the program, and they had a 64% reduction of ACL injuries in this intervention group. So the, it was a really great program, as, uh, it was made as a warm-up program, and with a really good results. And the, then we also have a lot of the uh, studies from Australia, uh, 31st, knee control, uh, and also s some studies from, from Europe. So there, and there are more studies uh, than, than I have shown you here, but there's been a lot of studies trying to make injury prevention programs that could work. And mostly these programs are made as warm-up programs. So they should be included as a start of the training. Uh, and they have been more or less successful from very low success. And the reason why I will come back to to high success in reducing ACL and lower extremity injuries. <coughs> and when we are working with this, we can say that if we sum up these studies, we could say that the research shows that structured training programs can reduce the risk of ACL injuries by 50%. And why have we, has we, have we shown the 50%? I think it's maybe an easy sell. People like easy numbers. So if I say that if you do this program, you can reduce the risk of getting an ACL injury or other lower extremity injuries with 50%, hopefully they will listen. The question is, do they listen? So, um, <coughs> and we need to get this message out to as many coaches and athletes and parents and sports take, uh, stakeholders as possible. Um, when we are trying to say, I want to say, say something about the barriers to this implementation of these programs. And uh, in this review uh, from, from uh, <coughs> uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they included this social ecological model to try to put all the barriers into this model, where we look at the, the barriers among athletes the coach-parents um, uh, barriers, the school or club, uh, look at the community as a whole, 
and the policy making agency. And uh, what they have, what they did in this um, uh, systematic review, they were looking at all prevention studies being out there, and they were looking at what did the authors tell them, what was the barriers, and for to get into this uh, this uh, review, they had to be mentioned as a problem at least two times. So this is barriers that coaches or athletes or stakeholders tell them is a problem with these programs. Um, so I think they are quite common and I think you will recognize them. So the barriers for <coughs> to implementation was mostly mentioned was motivation, the time requirements for, the, for doing these programs, skill requirements for the program facilitators, compliance and cost. And I will go through this more in detail. Motivation. Lack of motivation can be a substantial barrier to implement these programs. And uh, what are the stuff that the, the, they were uh, talking about was, for example, the exercises are boring. And I think you all have heard that. I think these exercises that you give me is quite boring. And that boredom give low motivation. So I think it's important to meet that and try to make exercises less bo boring. They also have said that they don't experience these program and exercises as challenging enough. Uh, and of course, if you if it's, if you have working with a large team, if you give the same exercises to all the athletes, you will experience that some thinks this is tough enough, but for some it's too easy. So it's necessary that you have exercise program with uh, progression or uh, a lot of variation to meet this. Uh, they also said that players and coaches in general had low motivation for injury prevention programs. And they also stated that the program are too static and not sport specific. And of course that's understandable. If you give exercises for a football player, which don't being at all close to what football players are doing, they don't want to do it. Then it's rehab. So I think we need to meet them for that. Uh, we also ex can experience a lack of a low motivation because of lack of confidence about the effectiveness of the program. So if the coach doesn't believe that this program can really reduce the number of, of injuries in my team, why should I use it? And some coaches, they are not willing to change their practice protocol because they mean I have done this for many years. I've done this training session and they work well. We have success. Why should I change it? Why should I use time on this? Uh, and they also says that it doesn't support my performance goals. These type of programs doesn't fit in, in my goals. And also a uh, common quote is that these programs are for the whole group. We need to have programs that are tailored to individual players. And then I want to go back to Eduard's talk last week. Um, if it's possible to screen and, and get screening tests that so we can pick out those athletes that are at higher risk. I don't think it all was very positive to that possibility. So what we see now, the, the best thing to do is giving the same medicine to all. Maybe not all need it, but most of them do. <coughs> Another barrier is obviously time. Uh, and it's often stated that the time required to conduct the program are a barrier. And we know that in many countries and sports, the availability of training time is limited. So coaches do not prioritize it. And I know here in Espetar, you have all the facilities that you need. So, you, you, so having enough uh, fields for playing football, that's not the problem here. But I know in many countries among youth athletes, they are, they are really struggling to get 
uh, one and a half hour, two, three times a week. And what we often see that young girls, 15, 16 years old, they are getting the training time from 9.30 to 10.30 in the evening. And they have to drive quite far. And that's not very motivating because then they get to bed at 12. So I think getting more uh, more places to do their sport is so important in, very man in, in many countries. Another barrier is the skill requirements, and especially for the coaches, because uh, in many of the programs we tell them, you have to em emphasize proper landing uh, technique, land with flexion in hip, knee, ankle, keep the knee over toe position, and we give them a lot of messages on how to implement this. And it could be difficult for some coaches to correct these mistakes. Uh, so we also saw that older coaches, and if they were overweight, they couldn't present the exercises. So if you are not managing to show this exercise for the youth athletes, well, then I don't take that uh, exercise into the program because I can't show them. And that's probably a little bit embarrassing for coaches that they can't uh, do their exercises. So those who, in, who are not uh, fit enough, they include fewer exercises. And that's why I think it's important when we do have, have courses for coaches, they have to do the exercises themselves. They, they can't sit like you are doing here, listen to this is a good exercise, you should imp implement them. They have to test them themselves, feel it on their own body, how are we going to do this, uh, this exercise. So uh, compliance or adherence, that's obviously a, <laughs> a barrier. <coughs> a barrier to, to get uh, satisfying results because we know that the, the different studies that are presented in the beginning, they had, you can call it success rate from very low to really high, high success rates. And that's just related to how many of the athletes did, do that, do, did uh, perform the exercises. So a high compliance the chance for getting good results are very high if the program or the exercises are good. So it's really important that we, we, um, we uh, have high compliance. And what about cost? A barrier could be cost, and that could be related to equipment because some prevention programs, they says that you need to have this and that uh, equipment. Um, and also some coaches want to have health personnel or specific coaches to perform these exercises and programs and that costs money. But I don't think that the program itself is costly because they are mostly free in all over the world. You can download the exercise and, and, get, uh, and get them easy accessible. So what I've gone through now is the most common um, barriers uh, for implementing these programs. So how to overcome the barriers? Well, here is <coughs> the barriers that we have been going through. And uh, this is the model that we think we need to reach out to, to reach all of these circles and try to see if it's possible to, to, uh, to, to, to change something regarding all these barriers. And I will give you some small examples of, of what we could do. And first I will try to give you what I could, yeah, I call it the Norwegian model. That's how we at the Oslo Sport Trauma Research Center has been working for uh, many years. And uh, then, and we are trying to influence the athletes, especially the athletes during uh, using social media. We have uh, a, a club event or train the trainer which goes directly into to influence what the knowledge for the parents, the coaches. We have made a new program called Prep to be a Pro, going into the sports schools. And we also go into the coach education program and help them to make courses that injury prevention is also included in the courses. Um, the policy making changes is not that easy. Um, my dream is that um, they 
give more can give more money for prevention instead of all this money for rehabilitation and treating all the injuries but that's uh, on a higher level <laughs> and you probably all know this uh, app get set train smarter which we developed together with IOC for many years ago it contains uh, all exercises pre preventing exercises and programs for um, all the Olympic sports it uh, has exercises for shoulder back knee hamstrings groin and shoulder and you can download the exercise program and it's easy easy to use and it's something that we give the parents and the coaches and the athletes themselves use this then you can try to find some exercises that may, may fit you in addition we have this website fit to play uh, and uh, um, <coughs> and here we, here we find a lot of, of uh, more information not only the prevention injury uh, prevention exercises but also about how to treat the injury uh, and how to treat an acute injury what do you do when you are uh, our um, coach this is what you do if you have an ankle uh, injury for example so uh, I will go through some of the stuff that we are working with for social media we um, we we can give some motivation by using uh, Instagram we have Facebook and of course Instagram reach the yo more young athletes coaches Facebook maybe the older one I'm not sure but uh, probably uh, <laughs> more uh, older uh, coaches and we have you know uh, did you know uh, a message sending out on Instagram every week for example that the reason why you are more clumsy during puberty is because arms and legs grows faster than the rest of the body and every week we give them these kind of information short and clear on Instagram we are wanted to go into TikTok because that's even more popular so we are trying to to the, do that as well and we also give them <coughs> tell them that there are no shortcuts if you want to be a really good athlete you have to take the stairs and um, and that uh, this is in no reason but there are the number of did you know tips to the athletes and what we show them here is that two of our best athletes uh, and gold winners in Olympics in cross-country skiing they were not good when they were 15 16 17 years old they, they were maybe ranked as number 70 in their age group so it takes time and we want to tell them you don't have to hurry so much use time to be as good as you can be and being as good as you can be includes try to avoid injuries because are you injured you are set back <clears throat> the other thing that we try to reach the grassroots level coaches so we try to train the trainer and what we try to do uh, is we, we want to help to organize help the coaches to organize the training because that's one of the barriers that we don't know how we can put these exercises into it so we have a two hour um, session and these courses are for free and we have 300 uh, physical therapists traveling around Norway having courses for free for the coaches and this is a one hour um, one hour with the theoretical stuff about growth and maturation acute injuries prevention exercises and the second hour they have to use the, the get set app and give some examples on how, which kind what kind of exercises do my team need my uh, what problems do my players have and then they try out these exercises during these courses and um, we have i think we have really good response on these uh, courses and <coughs> and we have evaluated them and we know that by now in 2023 we have had 4000 evaluations we have been uh, we have almost 300 this club event throughout Norway and we got really good uh, response they say that they have increased the implementation of the get setup because they are asked the day they are at the, at the course and three months after 
And after three months, they have increased the implementation of the app. They have more knowledge. And they also say that they have changed the training practice. I mean, we, have, we do not have any evidence on that because we are not testing it with injuries as endpoint. But I think we reached a lot of, of coaches' trainings, especially youth athletes, in, in this effort. Uh, so what about the sports academy and educational program? We are, there's a large number of sports acad academies that take children from 14 uh, of age who show athletic potential. Uh, and there's also a push for keeping a broad approach to sport and avoiding specialization too early. Uh, so, so many of the athletes, they, uh, or the students end up playing at high level and are really getting good um, results. Um, so we have managed, we had made what we call prep to be pro. So it's, it says enough, maybe you have to need time to get to pro. And that's a program for educa educating robust and healthy youth and elite athletes. The education tool is developed and we um, hope to increase the robustness and resilience and confidence for these young athletes because they have really hard days with all this all the stuff they are doing during one one day so hopefully uh, we can increase their awareness on how to make good choices for themselves and uh, what we have made um, it's 10 teaching modules there are four for the junior high school and six for the senior high school and um, the first modules consist of performance training, growth and maturation, eat smart about nutrition and be aware. And typically that's transition period. Uh, and the next uh, six ones are more about performance training, load management, total load, recovery, sport nutrition and sport psychology. Um, and it's, uh, I think it addresses challenges that are typically for the athletes during their everyday hassle. Uh, so um, I think this is a way to reach out to the young one and it's made in a way that we have made a PowerPoint presentation with that the teachers are doing this, the teacher and coaches at the schools are giving this presentation for the, for the youngsters and um, we now try to evaluate how they like it, if it does make any changes. So this is really a new, new project that we have a PhD st a student on. So it's really exciting to see if this can make them more aware of what, uh, what it means to be want to become a pro and what you have to do to take care of your uh, yourself. So that's for the, the, um, the young athletic athletes that we have and they are re reaching to be very good. And we also have this uh, national uh, coach certification program where we are come into this program and have been working with the level one module and for us it has been important to in all modules you should have something about injury prevention training so we are sure that they have get this reminder all the time and uh, this this level one is mandatory part of the basic coach uh, certification for all trainers uh, coaches in Norway so uh, it, um, it includes a lot of basic knowledge, but I think it's important to give them this basic knowledge. And then we also have these level two uh, courses, which are sport specific courses. And this is, um, includes information about acute and overuse injuries, growth and maturation, athleticism versus early specialization, and also warm up as injury prevention. We, so, so these courses include more than prevention, but it's tell them more about how to keep their athletes healthy. Um, we also have these sport specific courses. This is from uh, Norwegian Snowboard Federation. Uh, so we cooperate with different federations and in Norway it's national, uh, natural to have courses for snow activities. So this is uh, snowboard. And uh, they have, um, actually, this video is taken in our only indoor 
uh, snow hole. It seems strange, but during summer they need to practice. So this is uh, uh, an indoor snow uh, training session place where where uh, they prepare to to get better athletes. So this is indoor, and uh, you see some of the the warm up exercises they do, and the coach that is into you, but. It's in Norwegian, so uh, what he says that in snowboard, you need to be strong. We train to tolerate tough landings from big jumps. If you have seen these big jumps, is so many, so high and so high loads. So it's really tough for especially the knees. And that's why we do injury prevention training, such as strength and neuromuscular training. We also have um, another example of our cooperation with National Sport Federation. And this is in uh, athletics, and we are we are in these um, courses. We are discussing sport-specific injuries and injury prevention training, and why, when, and how it can be implemented for the athletes. So we have workshops for <coughs> the, those who develop the coach courses. So we have we try to educate them so they include what we need is important. <coughs> so we know that injury prevention works and I think we have a model that can hopefully improve the implementation of these programs and um, and we need to continue uh, to include those grassroots level courses because I think it's important to reach the young athletes because that's where it starts that that's where we can do changes in how they do their uh, warm-up routines, for example. So th that's it. Uh, that's an important thing. So, um, so the question is: Are we? Does it matter what we call it? Is ACL injury prevention the same as performance enhancement? Because we got a lot of response. But oh, we are. We want to have performance enhancement. We want our athletes to be better. We don't want to do ACL prevention training. So is that the same or isn't it? That's a discussion. Uh, we can hear what you mean about that. But I think it matters what do we call it. And this is just an example from um, Australia, Football Australia, where they have um, made a program, which is actually um, FIFA 11 plus with hip and groin exercises. They have um, made the program split, so you have a warm-up part and what they call the performance part, which probably sounds better. Um, and they give the coaches more flexibility in how they, when are they doing this exercise, when are they doing this exercise. And I think that's a good way of, of uh, making this easier accessible for coaches and probably queen, uh, <coughs> players as well. In, uh, in um, you know, I talked about the Swedish uh, knee control program. They have now made what they call knee control plus with the changes to try uh, after um, following these uh, teams that really succeeded in reducing the number of ACL injuries. They, <coughs> they did uh, see a reduction of the implementation of the program. And then they asked the coaches and had studies looking at that. And what they, what they did was that they increased the number of exercises. So in the original program, it was 30. Now they increased it to 60, which means that the coach can pick easier, can pick the exercises that they like. So we meet maybe the, the boredom stuff, uh, which is a barrier. They have included more heavy, explosive, and plyometric exercises. They have included more pair ex exercises, maybe giving it more fun, not that boring. And also uh, rubber band exercises. And instead of telling the coach that you're going to add three times 15 rep of this exercise, they have said you can do this uh, exercise 20 seconds, for example. So they have changed it from repetitions to time, which is make it also probably better for the coaches. They, they did like this better. And they also have uh, given them some tips for how can you instruct this athlete. Meeting the barrier regarding it's difficult to know how we should do it. And they have also given more external focus on how they 
uh, tell tell the coach to to um, to instruct the players, which I think also are really good. And uh, in in addition, a more flexibility of how you deliver the program. You don't need it 15 minutes before training. You could take five minutes before, maybe some exercise during and some after. So the point is just to get this this um, exercises out in a way and maybe not the way we have been using uh, today so well we we need to to go further we need to give acl injury awareness and educational programs we have to think lower extremity injuries not only acl because if you are going to have an acl injury prevention program you have a groin you have a hamstrings program it takes too too much time so you have to get injuries that maybe packs pack this together that takes less time and if you're a handball player you also have something for the shoulder which takes a, even more time <coughs> so i think that's important maybe make online tutorials or low cost videos easy accessible tiktok instagram use those platforms that are out there to reach the group that we want to reach try to get policy changes among sporting associations and also have media campaigns and uh, what we i'm a part of a media campaign or a, a, a program from uefa because during the last uh, Euro european championship we probably got all the acl injured stars and when the stars get injured then it gets a lot of attention and now uh, they uh, UEFA want to use a lot of attention on how can we prevent injuries so there will be a campaign up to 2025 euro championship so uh, i think that's good because we need to get help for those who have the money and UEFA has money and of course fifa so uh, that that could be good and there's a lot of research gaps there are uh, a lot of people want us to to develop short and cost effective injury prevention programs they should be shorter not 15 20 minutes maybe five minutes it's not easy and they should contain exercises that are fun sport specific challenging and individualized it's quite it's not easy <laughs> to make this but it could be a way you're going and you see the last thing acl injury prevention programs should should um, be co-created by different stakeholders in sport, including end users, club administrators, regional and national federation, and science is to really work. And just at the end, now I just want to show you what we have been struggling with in Norway right now. We have we tried to develop uh, a preventing program in youth sport, and this is handball and football and the reason that it's handball and football is that that's the two largest sports in Norway where there's a lot of youth athletes and we have been working with um, yeah we try to include uh, topics by beyond conducting the predefined injury prevention programs and with this scoping re review among hand handball and football coaches they want us wanted to address uh, areas like communication and management of load because load they have a lot of overuse injuries so they want to include that they want to have pain management what what shall i do when my athletes come and says i have pain in my knee should you say just continue or maybe go and do something on the sideline and do some push-ups and stuff like that and they wanted to get some help about that they wanted to get some help about uh, when they have been injured, how is the phase when we are going back to sport again? How can I, I need some help for that? Uh, and I think that's uh, that's uh, a really good uh, uh, what we come out from those scoping re reviews because I think uh, and the cross -sex sectional study because we got the coaches' opinion about uh, how can we change the behavior of the coaches what what do they like to get if they should change what they were doing so what we are we have now done a feasibility study among handball and um, 
uh, football clubs. And we are now planning to randomize control studies uh, with a lot of uh, um, participants. So one for handball and one for football. And I think uh, it, it's challenging, but we hope that listening to what the coaches and players really wanted to have, that maybe could help. And it starts with they are first, the coach will first have an e-learning um, um, module after some while they end with some uh, some um, they have to do plan their exercises that they would like to use in in their uh, club then we have a workshop physically with them where we go through and discuss the program and then we follow them and have a new workshop at the end so what it will what it will give us we don't know but hopefully we could now we have really listened to the coaches and players but it's difficult to reach out with this knowledge, but hopefully this is a way of looking more broad on how we can prevent injuries. So we know the barriers as we have been going through. It's motivation, time requirements, skill requirements for program facilitators. It's about compliance and cost uh, and how we can do something with that. We should create shorter programs co-creation of injury prevention programs with coaches and players, have flexibility of the program delivery, involve the coaches, which is so important, and use social media. Uh, I think for me, uh, I would love that we ended and say that this is just, you're just doing training. And a part of this training that you do every day is the one exercises or, the, or what it ends up to be that protect your health and your knees and whatever. So I really hope that we end up calling it just training. We are do, you are doing your training and that makes you safer and uh, reduces the risk of injuries. Uh, and before I say thank you, I just want to remind you on the, this uh, World Congress in Sport Physiotherapy in Oslo uh, next summer, which I think will be really nice. And I also hope I see a lot of you in Monaco in February, March. That will be really good. So thank you very much. <laughs>